To begin, we would like to recognize that our event today takes place on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, whose presence on and caretaking of this land stretches back millennia. As guests on this land, creating sacred spaces has an obligation to honor, respect, and listen to the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We commit to helping with the ecological and cultural presentation of this territory, looking to the example of its traditional guardians. We acknowledge that we, as a largely settler organization, have upheld held colonial ideas, whether by action or inaction, and we pledge to, conti to continual anti-racist decolonizing action. We would also like to acknowledge the, di the diversity of belief systems, faith traditions, and cultural backgrounds at today's gathering. As we network and share our ideas tonight, we are committed to genuine, thoughtful, and respectful interfaith dialogue. We aim to learn from each other in a spirit of openness, honesty, and care, recognizing our commonalities and celebrating our differences. I'd like to invite you as participants in this green gathering, both online and in person, to join us both in honoring the traditional keepers of this territory and in listening to each other in interfaith dialogue. Um, I'm just gonna pass this on for a second to Christina. Christina um, has been with the Faith in the Common Good Network for a long time. She is also part of Rideau Park United Church, as many of you know. Thanks so much, Charlie, and hello to all of you online. I guess I'm just a way over there. And uh, good evening to everybody here in person. Thanks so much. This is my first uh, Greening Sacred Spaces gathering in many years in person. So that's really exciting. And of course, as the chair of the Environment Committee here at Rideau Park United Church, I'm just thrilled to, uh, to be able to help host this event and to be part of our network. I also love this photo behind me of Manon's family. It's just such a great uh, feeling of community and spirit. And, uh, and I just uh, think that's kind of what this network is all about, helping to encourage organizations and faith communities to support each other, to work together. And there's so many challenging issues of climate change and sustainability that we face that it sometimes can be very discouraging. And what I've always loved about my faith involvement in these issues is that we can really take a deeper look from our value perspective and look at how we address these issues, but also having hope and, uh, and a focus for the future. So that's why I've been involved in this network since 2004. And uh, I love seeing how we can connect with organizations across the city. And we're one of the oldest chapters in Canada. So it's really great for us to be part of this important conversation. So thanks for having me. And again, hello, a shout out to all those people online. It's great to see you here. Back to Charlie. Thank you so much, Christina. So uh, before we begin, I just wanted to give a little update on the program that is making a lot of this possible, the Energy Benchmarking Program. So as many of you know, this is a program that we've been uh, hosting for several years that helps uh, faith communities um, measure and track their energy consumption. It's a free program that, um, uh, really takes a lot of the work and effort from faith communities tracking and measuring to us. So we have almost 50, we have 47 out of our 50 goal um, faith communities within the program and we are hoping to get three more. Um, so if you are interested in joining and you haven't already, please please uh, reach out to Hannah or to me or any of our team and we will be happy to give you more information about that. Um, we also wanted to talk about quickly about um, the fossil fuel treaty. So this is a global initiative to phase out fossil fuels. Um, there is now an open letter from faith leaders and organizations in advance of the UN Climate Change Conference in Scotland. Um, and we have been asked uh, to spread the word in our network about faith communities who might want to sign on to that letter to encourage the end of fossil fuels. And um, uh, I think Hannah will put more information about that in the chat. And you can also contact us at the end of the evening if you want. Um, so at this point, we're going to let people both virtually and in person take a moment to sort of introduce themselves. Um, so I'm going to let Hannah take care of that on virtually and sort of we can go around this room while they're going around their room um, and sort of just saying your faith community and also, you know, your name and maybe an activity that you've been doing with regards to greening recently. I have our first presentation of the night. 
Um, the presentation is by Peter and Gerald, who we in the room met just now. Um, it, Peter Black is a former assistant director of policy analysis in the Federal Office of Energy Efficiency, delivering programs to mitigate global warming. He has studied the history of Canadian government's emission reduction targets, policies, and results. Gerald Oakham is a distinguished research professor in science at Carleton University. He is looking at the science behind global warming and the actions that need to be taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit climate change. He has also studied the impact of global warming uh, on our lives and the adaptations required to live with the climate change uh, changes that will occur. So their presentation is called Global Warming and What to Do About It. Well, thank you for inviting us to come and speak uh, to you today. Would you like to go to the next slide? So global warming, uh, this frames it for us. It's the temperatures over the past 2000 years on the left. And you can see they were pretty stable for most of that time, but suddenly about 200 years ago, the temperatures took off and you can see them rising. Now the plot on the right-hand side of that uh, uh, slide shows what happened over the past 200 years from 1850 up to now. And there's a couple of features of that. The black line is the actual temperature record. The blue line is what would be constructed about what should have happened if man had not got involved in emitting greenhouse gases. And the brown one shows the prediction for what would happen if we do, when we do put the greenhouse gases out. And I think this plot fairly convincingly shows us that temperature rise or global warming is real. And not only that, it's man-made as well. Um, and you can see that the temperatures have gone up about 1.1, 1.2 degrees. These plots come from the IPCC, or the International Panel on Climate Change. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if you go to the next slide, please. Yes. OK, that's a good idea. Thank you. So global warming is caused by greenhouse gases. And you've heard this so many times there. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. But carbon dioxide is the major cause of global warming. But carbon dioxide is a natural part of life. Plants uh, absorb carbon dioxide and give off oxygen, and we breathe the oxygen in and give out carbon dioxide. And it's been stable for a long period of time, so it's been below 300 ppm for the past 800,000 years. And it's only recently things have changed. And that's because of the use of our machines and our electrical production uh, causing CO2 to be emitted. Also, the agriculture has had an effect on it as well. When we clear land for uh, producing plants, it absorbs less CO2, and so the CO2 goes up. The levels in the atmosphere are now close to 400 ppm and rising rapidly. And of course, the greenhouse gases act like a blanket. They're always there, they always have been there. Uh, that's why we have a reasonably moderate Earth that we have the greenhouse gases keeping the temperatures where they are. But now, because they're going up, our temperatures are going up too. So on to the next slide, please. So how do we know what's going to happen in the future? It comes about from a bunch of climate models. These are complicated programs run by research groups that take a lot of factors into account. And they look and see what's going to happen to the environment, the temperature, sea level rise, and ocean acidity due to the increase of greenhouse gases. The IPCC combines these predictions from the different models and they find the most likely outcome. And the variation between the different models gives the range of likely outcomes as well. To explore what's going to happen when we do interactions with the environment, they've come up with a bunch of scenarios which they all use. And there's ones like business, of, business as usual, where we don't have any cuts with greenhouse gases, and they're given by numbers 7.0 and 8.5. And then there's the ones that go for green and then you try to reduce to get the greenhouse gases to net zero by around 2050, and they're labeled 1.9 and 2.6, but we'll see that on the next slide, so I can see where that is. So this is the climate modeling for temperatures. The black line on the left is what's already happened. The colored line is what's going to happen with these models. So you can see the red lines, that means that if we don't do anything, the temperatures are gonna go up to four or five degrees by the end of the century. If we control the greenhouse gases, then the temperatures we could keep them below two degrees, 
And if we're really lucky, we could keep them below one and a half. One other thing about this plot is that you see the red line, that shows the most likely increase. The red band shows the range of uncertainty about what's going to happen over the next time. So we go to the next slide. So there is some uncertainty about climate predictions, and that's due to these tipping points. And that is the Earth's climate has semi-stable features that can give rise to runaway temperature increases. For instance, permafrost is one of these. Melting of the permafrost releases methane, which is a very strong greenhouse gas, and that can accelerate global warming, which can cause more uh, permafrost to melt. So it's a cycle that can get worse. Same with Arctic sea ice and the Greenland glacier, for instance, as the glacier melts in the summer, it becomes darker and it absorbs more sunlight and you get more melting. So that's the problem with that. And the issue is that the exact temperature at which these tipping points are important is very difficult to predict. So it's, it's not clear what's going to happen, but we can see what the likely cause, likely effect of this on the next uh, plot. This shows sea level rise. So here um, you can see the colors that we had before. The, uh, the ones on the bottom are the ones where we control greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see the temperature rise, the sea level rise is about a half a meter. If you go to the ones where we don't control the greenhouse gases, you can see it's going up by about a meter by the end of the century. But if we get into these unstable features, this dashed line shows we could have sea level rises of one and a half or two meters by the end of the century. The other thing I want to point out on this plot is that even if we're controlling greenhouse gases, the sea level is going to rise and it's going to keep rising for many hundreds of years, unless we do something drastically different. Go on to the next slide, please. So global warming is already impacting our lives. For example, there's the intense forest fires at northern latitudes. So um, one that we know about is in Fort McMurray in 2016, and that had a big effect on the, on the residents there, and a number of them already suffered from PTSD as a result of these fires. We also had extreme weather in Otto. We had two one in 100 year floods in quick succession, and we had an invasion of plants and animals as the habitat zones move. So you probably are aware that Lyme disease is now more common in Ottawa, it's endemic. When I got a tick this summer, I had to get antibiotics right away because I didn't know whether it had Lyme disease or not. And of course, we've had new temperature records. There was one this week on the prairies. It was very hot there. And in the summer in Lytton, the temperature of 49.6, which is the highest temperature in Canada was recorded. And of course, we had the disastrous fire that followed that. More globally, there's the destruction of the coral reefs in uh, tropical latitudes. And there's a problem that there are some regions of the world that a combination of temperature and humidity exceeds the point where people can live. The next slide. So what's happening about this? Well, it's being led by the United Nations. They've put together a number of groups that are looking at this. One of them is this IPCC I mentioned before, and they produce consensus reports uh, from a bunch of scientists looking at them and then print those off so that you can have access to them. That's a scientific body. There's a more political body called the Conference of Parties or the COP meetings. And the one you've probably heard most about is the Paris meeting in 2015. At that meeting, there was an agreement uh, where 197 countries agreed to limit their greenhouse gas emissions to keep future global warming to less than two degrees and try for one and a half degrees as well. Following that, in 2018, the IPCC looked at what that really meant. And it means to keep it to one and a half degrees, it would require decreasing our net emissions from 2010 by, 200, by 2030 by 45% and getting to net zero by 2050. Just to be clear, net zero means that we know that we're always gonna emit some greenhouse gases, so if you, you've got to try and absorb carbon to compensate for that. Um, the latest IPCC report was in August, 2021. And most of the plots I'm showing here are from that report. And as mentioned in one of the introductions, the next COP meeting is in Glasgow uh, in November of this year, which is very important for looking at the goals that are being reached. 
or sort of trying to be set. Next slide. So how's Canada doing? How is Canada doing? Well, not very well, to be honest, pretty poorly. This is a plot from Environment Canada. It's the government's own report, not mine. And you can see on the left, that's the historical perspective of what the greenhouse gas emissions have been. On the right, this is the projection of this group based on all federal, provincial, and territorial policies as of September 2020. So this is their reporting. You can see the drop that occurred for COVID-19. It rises again shortly afterwards, and then it's flat. So why is it like that? Well, Canada's gas tax is currently nine cents per litre. And if you look at that, less than 7% of the price of gas. So it's not having a big impact on what people do or don't do. Basically, Canada has the worst record for reducing greenhouse gas emissions of any in the G7, when you look at the numbers from 1999 to 2019. So, how are we rated? This is how we rated in terms of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. Well, we're highly insufficient. So we're not there. The 2021 election is over. So we knew what was promised in that election, but what are we actually going to get and we'll have to see what policies the government actually puts in place. COP26 is coming up, and Canada will have to put their nationally determined contributions on the table. What exactly are they going to do? We can guess, but we don't know for sure. But that's very important. Go to the next one. Global warming, how do we limit it? Well, there are things you can do individually. So you can reduce your carbon footprint with your car and your house. You can work on investment choices, try to go for green rather than oil or gas uh, uh, investments, purchase carbon offsets if you do travel. But of all the things you can do, the most important thing is to lobby government. I'll come back to that in a moment. Industry, well, they can plan for a low carbon economy. That's very important. They can avoid holding stranded assets, oil uh, fields that are not really effective anymore. And they can focus on something called ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. Uh, they can use that in their company reporting to shareholders and in management. And these things not only will improve the environment and confirm this, but they'll also probably improve the bottom line. So this is an important thing that companies can do. Come to the next slide. So it's the role of governments that's important because they have the ability to do the radical action that we need to combat climate change. They have unique powers. They can put taxes in place. They can apply a carbon tax, which is the most effective way of dealing with climate change in terms of uh, money, the, the amount you can get reduction in terms of CO2 emissions. They can regulate, they can phase out coal use. They can require that uh, fleets of vehicles from car, from car manufacturers have reduced CO2 emissions, and they can put the infrastructure in place there's no way people are going to buy lots of EV cars if they can't charge them on the road. So that has to be in place too. They can promote green tech. If we want to work on having uh, uh, geothermal energy, then that probably needs government investment. Then there's land use, managing forests, planting trees, all of the things that governments have a handle to do. So we've had our election. We needed to elect a government that had an effective climate change action. I won't comment on that right now. Um, but after the election, we still need to lobby our elected representatives. They need to hear that this is an important issue for us, and they will listen because they have to go back to the voters in four years at least. Four years at least. Thanks, Tom. In the meantime, it's going to keep going. We, we are not going to be able to avoid climate change. So things need to be done to adapt to it. Government probably need to work on flood mapping for coasts and rivers. They need to storm-proof hydro grids because we're going to have all these cars charging. And also, if a line goes down, then we're not going to have any power. So they need multiple lines, so that has to be done. And we're going to have to have cooling centers for public use in heat waves. And we're actually going to prepare for this wave of climate migrants that are going to be coming to our shores. Business, contingency, contingency planning for a warming world, allowing for stranded assets, and private citizens. What we do now will impact our children, our grandchildren, 
and future generations. There is hope for this, but we must all act. So thank you. Next speakers are going to be some faith communities. So uh, we have a handful of faith communities. We're just going to talk about sort of what they've done as examples of, you know, sort of to get some ideas. Um, our first ones, we're going to take a couple in the room and then we're going to move to a couple that we have um, online. So Derwin, um, if you could uh, come first. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, uh, my name is Derwin Sangster. I chair the stewardship committee at the Church of St. Thomas the Apostle, an Anglican church just up the street. Um, for us, uh, environmental questions are a stewardship issue. Uh, you've heard of stewardship of the environment. We uh, are very much uh, interested in the whole question of um, the proper use of resources to achieve ministry. And that speaks to both the stewardship angle and of course the environmental angle. I'm gonna talk about three things uh, essentially that, that we've done um, very simply. I don't have any, don't have any slides, <laughs> it's just me. Um, but I'm gonna talk about uh, some experience we've got with the green audit we did some years ago. I'd like to talk a little bit about our experience with the GSS energy benchmarking uh, program. And I've been asked also to mention uh, a few words about a, a community garden that we just uh, that we just put in. So some very practical stuff. Um, we had a green audit then. We found out there was a bit of funding in, I guess, 2013 for uh, par uh, faith communities that wanted to uh, have a green audit done. So we applied for it and received a bit of funding to have a walkthrough. And, and uh, uh, David Patterson from, um, uh, from GSS uh, was the auditor and walked us through with our property committee and uh, pointed out uh, the various uh, uh, things that we might do, everything from sort of fixing, you know, leaky doors to uh, making sure that uh, our boilers were as energy efficient as possible and making sure that some of the old refrigerators that we had been given that, that uh, consumed enormous amounts of energy, suggesting that they'd be replaced very quickly. And a number of other absolutely specific uh, recommendations that, uh, that came out of that green audit, many of which we were able to uh, implement uh, as sort of low hanging fruit, relatively easy things to do. Uh, Shortly after that, we had a, 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 some renovations done in, the, in, the, in various parts of the church. And I tried to ensure that some of the results of our green audit impacted, uh, had, a, had an impact on those uh, decisions made around those renovations. I have to say that I wasn't entirely successful. There were some cost concerns uh, uh, taken in the context of the renovations that meant that many of the things that, uh, that we, that came out of our, our green audit, which um, cost a little bit of money, couldn't be done at the time. Uh, fo folks from faith communities will know <clears throat> that uh, money is always, uh, is, is always a, a, an object. Um, in any case, uh, we were able to do some things <clears throat> and the, uh, the report, because there are some things that we haven't yet done, that report still remains quite current, and I'll and I'll get uh, uh, I'll get onto that. The the next uh, thing I'd like to talk about very briefly is the fact that I guess in 2019 we discovered uh, the um, Greening Sacred Spaces Energy Benchmarking uh, Project, and and uh, uh, we applied for that. Uh, we had to get permission, obviously, as many folks will know, we had to get permission from our parish leaders to uh, share our um, uh, uh, various uh, account data at Enbridge and, uh, and Hydro with GSS to allow GSS to do that, to get access to those, we, we were able to do that. And I guess it was late 2020 or early this year, we received from, from GSS our first report, um, which uh, actually went back four years, uh, 2017, 18, 19, and 20. So we had a little bit of a time series of, uh, that plotted our energy use on a per square foot basis. Uh, and uh, and uh, was instructive, although I guess the, my, my, my own personal take was that what was missing was a kind of context 
um, a set of other faith communities, other buildings to whom we could compare our own energy use so we could see how, how well we were doing. Um, I, I went back and subsequently did get uh, a, a comparator uh, from, I guess it was, it was human on it that, that sent it to me. And I guess in a way, I'm sorry that I did because our comparisons with other faith communities were pretty poor. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, greening sacred spaces, it's these folks. Um, and so uh, we, uh, Kind of, we'll wait to see uh, what our uh, report. There's an there's another um, year's worth of data coming, uh, uh, I guess in another six months, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, what has been apparent from the data that we've seen, of course, is the impact of of COVID on on the numbers. Clearly, there have been some weather effects. We aren't quite we haven't quite sort of unpacked those. But, uh, but we're going to be interested to see uh, the next report and not expecting, frankly, to move very far in the short term in terms of our comparison with other, other churches, other faith, other faith communities. We'll still be uh, probably towards the bottom, but there's, there's some value in that too, which I'll get, which I'll get to. Uh, the, the, the Anglican Diocese of Ottawa is currently requiring of its parishes a number of things, one of which is a, a building condition assessment, which is to look in an orderly way at their church buildings and come up with a sort of a renovation, five or 10 year renovation plan or schedule uh, with a view to, first of all, identifying what needs to be done over that time period. And secondly, trying hopefully to make sure that when money needs to be spent, that it's actually there. So there's a sort of a planning, a renewal planning process, which makes an enormous amount of sense. I've tried to make sure that the company doing our uh, building condition assessment has been supplied both with our 2013 green audit report, as well as our energy benchmarking report and its comparisons, hoping that the, the green side, if you will, of, of, uh, of the parish um, buildings will perhaps receive a little bit of attention and a little bit of coverage in the uh, building condition assessment that is about to, uh, that is in the process of, of being done. So I'm hoping that that data will, uh, will inform uh, perhaps some decisions or some conclusions or some recommendations in terms of further um, renovations that we might be doing uh, at the at the parish. So we'll 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 see that uh, and keep our fingers crossed. But that um, past the past work that we've done is in a position now still to be relevant in helping hopefully guide some decisions. The other, the final thing I guess I'll talk about was, is uh, our community garden. We put it in uh, last last summer. Uh, we noticed, I noticed that uh, there was a lot of, in the middle of COVID, there was a lot of concern about um, uh, food security. So I went to our parish council and I said, you know, I really think we need to put in a community garden. <laughs> and they said, great idea, go away and do it. You've got our full support, but you've got no money. <laughs> Well, that was a mixed blessing, I have to say. But at the end of the day, we were able to go away and do it. We applied uh, for uh, to Just Food, which is the City of Ottawa sort of community gardening organization, uh, for uh, membership and recognition, so that we would be eligible for any grants that they might have to provide equipment and startups and seeds and equipment and uh, uh, various various things. We found that we had a separate independent source of funding that came from a neighboring parish that joined us. So we didn't need to apply to the city for funding. So we were able to go ahead. We turned out to be, find ourselves a, a fairly, um, a fairly affluent garden actually. Um, so we were able to put it into, uh, oh, that's the, okay, yeah. That's the picture of our community garden in front of our church with a sign that, that was made by one of our parish members. Um, and it's been a, quite a success for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
I decided to be worth trying to sort of keep some statistics on the output. One of the conditions for people taking plots is that they uh, donate at least 10% of what they grow to the Heron Emergency Food Center, the local food bank. We also had three plots that were uh, these three right along by the path that were St. Thomas plots sort of communally held and all of what they grow went to the food center, uh, to the Heron Emergency Food Center. This first plot, a little bit of lettuce in the front, this first plot has produced to date 2,500 cherry tomatoes and it's still going and there's still more. And it's astonishing. And we've been sort of scratching our heads and saying, where did this come from? But at the end of the day, uh, it's been a very, very uh, community building and, and, uh, and uh, uh, encouraging enterprise. Um, about uh, two weeks ago, um, a group interested in putting a, a farmer's market into Alta Vista were driving by looking for places and they saw our community garden. And they said, if those folks have a community garden, maybe they might want to host uh, one of our farmers markets. Discussions at the moment are ongoing about us possibly uh, being a location for one of their farmers markets. So unexpected things happen from that. I'll stop there. That's three very sort of disjointed pieces of, uh, of uh, aspect of storage of what we've done, but I hope it's uh, helpful. Take any questions in whatever way you want to organize it. Our next speaker is from St. Basil, um, Margaret Bott, uh, who has a few words to say. So just speak towards the group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, St. Basil's uh, is over 60 years old now. And uh, as I said, that the, we have, um, since 1917, we've been part of the Green Churches Network. And, yeah, thank you. I will strive to build a green parish and uh, answer the call for protecting the environment and uh, promoting a green lifestyle for our parishioners. But in the past few years, we've carried out many major upgrade and repair projects to address um, the aging building. We launched the Restored Foundation campaign in 2015. And during this campaign, we replaced all the basement windows with well-insulated windows and installed lead lighting throughout the church. Um, the deteriorated wooden facade of the bell tower was replaced with more sustainable materials. In 2018, we took further actions on improving our building in terms of environmental protection and accessibility and started another campaign called Accessibility and Hospitality Campaign. And during this time, we have replaced the antique boiler and the basement heating system with energy efficient ones and also installing a new elevator to make the church accessible as well as the new roof so with additional insulation so uh, our efforts have greatly enhanced the energy consumption performance of our facility however we are still in debt for a lot of money, as you well know. And I think the latest um, things that we did, I believe cost about $250,000 and we're still $100,000 in debt, looking for money. And, but we want to continue on as we are able to. We are now talking about solar panels that probably won't go on the roof of our church because of the way it's constructed it's a round church flush toilets and there's always something else you can do to green a building um sorry i'm losing my glasses here with the mouse um, we have uh, been introduced to a government project 
I had information about that from the news. It's called the um, Green and Inclusive Community Buildings. It does not, it's not uh, for churches. However, our church, our basement, is used by many, many people who are not associated with the church. Such as the Myanmar refugee community, the Kadri Native Ministry, AA users, and a number of other things. We, we thought that if we were able to apply to the government program, anything to do with the upgrading of the community would apply. Um, there was a certain date. Um, at the moment, so we are reaching out. I think we talked to Aaron and Co. Energy. Do you know him? No, okay. But we are reaching out to, to get some um, um, quotes about um, solar panels. I don't know. Uh, we really, I don't really know. Um, I'm on the green team, so I don't know whether that's going to do that because it's so expensive, but maybe you could give some ideas about that. And so, just little by little, whatever needs doing. Everything is done in the screening the building in mind. I'm interested in your community garden, and maybe we could talk about that some more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, Trinity United Church is on Maitland Avenue in the west end of Ottawa. We've long had a focus on social justice and environmental issues. I recall a service put on by the youth group in about 1970, warning of concerns at that time about air and water pollution. And since about the mid 1970s, Trinity has had a justice committee, which explores the pressing issues of the day, makes the congregation aware of the concerns and provides opportunity for action. A few years ago, the Trinity Justice Committee spent two years exploring the issue of climate change and how to reduce our personal carbon footprint. We then turned our attention to the church building and our church activities. And although Trinity has long worked to be a green church, we recognize that there was probably more we could do. On Earth Day 2018, with Elizabeth May in attendance, we announced the launch of Trinity's green team. Representatives of most committees, the Sunday School, youth group, and other interested people came together to explore ways to reduce the church's carbon footprint and other green initiatives. And to guide us and challenge us in this work, we decided to participate in the Greening Sacred Spaces Green Certification Program. We've received our certificates for both the light and medium green levels. And just before COVID hit, we had completed the required 10 actions at the highest level, dark green. We had about four additional activities planned, but those were curtailed by the shutdown. Once our church opens up again this coming Sunday and we're able to meet in person, we will revisit this to see what is possible and then apply for our dark green certificate. We printed our accomplishments at each level on light and medium green paper leaves, which we hung on a small tree hung there by representatives of the committees responsible for the actions during a church service. This tree has been displayed in the church lobby for people to see what we've accomplished. In terms of energy efficiency, we were proactive in having a building energy assessment done in 2003. The upgrades that could reasonably done were carried out at that time. We also explored having solar panels installed on the roof, but this turned out not to be feasible. Our main challenge has been funding. Our church was built in 1963 and it has not had a lot of upgrades. With the declining size of the congregation, the church council has been fiscally prudent. Retrofitting that would make a significant reduction in our building's carbon footprint has not been financially possible. We have, however, made a number of small improvements, which have included caulking the outside of the building and windows from the outside, closing in the ceiling above the side aisles that went up to the peak of the church, and installing new low-flow aerator faucets and low-flush toilets. 
We track our utility expenditures and consumption in-house. Our lighting has been upgraded with CFLs installed where possible and LEDs replacing fluorescent bulbs and being installed in the parking lot. The sign in front of our church is powered by solar panels. Our hot water tank used for heating much of the building has a circulating pump that's on a timer set to when people are actually in the building. And when buying new appliances, we ensure that they are Energy Star certified. We've banned single use water bottles quite a while ago and have encouraged the use of our green bin and recycling by our congregation and other user groups who use the building. We've even produced an instructional video on how to sort the garbage. Uh, recently, this recycling requirement was included in our building use policy. We've re provided receptacles for used batteries and computer ink cartridges. Cleaning is done with a vacuum fitted with a HEPA filter, and we use only recycled or FSC certified paper. We've installed a bike rack and held bicycle rallies to teach safe biking skills and are investigating the feasibility of using green salt in the parking lot. We do as many things as we can out outdoors, including Sunday school and a recent baptism and confirmation. And this fall, our minister has been offering sessions of Forest Church in Andrew Hayden Park. As much as possible, we try to examine our practices through a green lens. What would have the lowest carbon footprint and be best for the environment? We use beeswax candles and the youth group sold these as a fundraiser and to encourage people to use them. Similarly, we have offered fair trade products for sale as a fundraiser, but more importantly, to encourage people to use such products. We look forward to getting back to work on our dark green certificate and finding other ways to make our church building and activities as green as possible. Thank you so much, Virginia. And our last speaker is uh, George McDonald from Barhaven, sorry, second last speaker um, from, a, from a faith community. So George, if you could just give us um, a few minutes of your time. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. <clears throat> Again, I apologize that my uh, video camera is on the fritz. Um, Barhaven's uh, program is not as uh, organized as some of the others. We haven't had a uh, recent energy audit. We don't have an established green team, but we've been doing a number of things over the last eight years or so. Um, the largest project in, in, that, uh, in the eight years was uh, replacement of all of our furnaces. We have five forced air furnaces that were replaced with high efficiency ones and the electrical heating in an outbuilding was replaced by a forced air natural gas furnace as well. We've been focusing on lighting throughout the, uh, all of our, our building. Uh, the fluorescent, fluorescent fixtures have virtually all been replaced with uh, uh, lower energy consumption uh, fixtures, outdoor security lighting, and even our outdoor sign. These have largely been done under a uh, program with Ottawa Hydro uh, to replace um, fixtures and they provide a two to three year payback in the energy and uh, we found that to be quite successful. The biggest uh, green project we have is our solar power uh, system. We've installed um, panels on two facets of our, uh, our, north, our uh, sanctuary roof which is a six-sided uh, uh, hexagon and they are at, at a good angle for solar power generation uh, we did this seven years ago under the MicroFit program, which is a feed-in tariff program by the uh, Ontario government, which is no longer uh, doing it. It was a, a program set up to encourage the um, advancement of solar power technology, uh, ultimately by reducing the cost of uh, solar panels and their related equipment. We spent $32,000 to install the solar power system seven years ago and uh, we broke even on the on the energy generated this last summer we have a contract with uh, uh, to provide uh, kilowatt hours for another 13 years it's a 20-year contract at 40 cents a kilowatt hour which will <clears throat> ultimately generate um, a return on our investment at the end of the 20 years we can decide to either install batteries or use the solar power directly for some um, some on-site source, but right now we're just feeding it all back into the grid. We also have a community garden. It's uh, been established for three or four years. It's uh, funded by the West Bar Haven uh, Community uh, uh, Organization and the Bar Haven Food Cupboard. Uh, we have quite a few plots and it's expanding. We're going to uh, install some trees next year 
and uh, provide a, an underground watering system to provide water to the uh, garden itself. So we have um, sort of an ongoing number of things. We do the, you know, uh, timers on thermostats and uh, and an efficient hot water heater and and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but we um, our our big projects would be our our furnaces, lighting, and our solar power system. So thank you very much, George and Virginia. Um, we have one more uh, faith community speaker. So that is um, Dennis from Ottawa Mennonite Church. I think you were. I was informed you were speaking. I don't know if you had anything prepared. Just speak into the green. Uh, if I looked reluctant, it was that I was expecting just to uh, give a brief uh, few comments as I did when we introduced each other. But uh, I would say that we are not as far along the road as the churches that we've just heard from, but uh, we are beginning to, to look that way and we'll look to some of you for some of our neighbors for some advice. We do have a green group. Uh, we recognize that. Uh, we're a group of people with interests, but uh, there are there is a church council and church structures in place that make decisions. And I'd like to chat with you a little bit later about uh, how you did it at your Anglican church, moving from a group of people who are interested to uh, uh, talking and persuading your uh, your uh, governing bodies to undertake some of these things. So um, I I will leave it at that because we don't have a huge amount to report right now, and I wouldn't want to mislead you. Thank you uh, so much for that, Dennis. Um, so now we are going to hear from Dan Vivian, uh, an engineer at Building Science Trust, um, who has some uh, talks about energy audits and net zero planning. Thank you so much. Yeah, it'll be here. And if you could just speak into the green, we'll get it up and see the trust. So just stand. And Oh. Okay. Um, you can change it. So I want to thank everybody for having me here. I hope that you will be blessed by this presentation. I know you will be surprised. Yes. Sure. Sure, I'm, uh, I'm okay. So, um, next slide. Uh, so about me, I'm a professional engineer with over 35 years of experience, 15 years of manufacturing experience, 17 years as a building science consultant engineer, four years of mining experience, and I'm a principal of the building science stuff. Uh, I was involved in the Anglican Church's look at building condition assessments, and further energy audits, um, you need both. A building condition assessment says change like for like. So if it's double glazed windows, they'll change it with double glazed windows and unfortunately ignore your uh, energy audits from before. You need to make the de decisions on the energy audits. So just a, 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 and an aside. Um, Skip through this. Oh, this is uh, so, yeah. Skip. So this is the. Let's go back one. This is um, not the presentation that I was expecting, but it's close enough. So um, the pro the largest problem is in two areas: transportation and in buildings. So. Approximately 40% of energy fossil fuels goes into transportation and approximately 40% in buildings. Uh, you'll see some other figures. Um, the other figures don't go back to the basis. The basis is like, you'll see figures for agriculture, but agriculture is things like barns on the building sides, tractors on the transportation side. So you need to get to the root. Next. I'll talk about the building portion. Next. So this is a, a mix for houses, but houses are kind of like a microcosm of larger um, structures. And, you know, the mix changes by the function, but 
this is about right. So about 65% in Canada goes into space heating, about 15% into domestic hot water, and about 20% into the electric load. Next. So <clears throat> this is what's important. So on the, the greenhouse gas emission by fuel thing, so the CO2 grams per kilowatt hour follow this kind of importance. So fuel oil it, uh, creates a lot of greenhouse gases. Propane, a significant amount of greenhouse gases. Natural gas, also a significant amount of greenhouse gas. Now look, in Ontario, electricity is very clean. Electricity hardly makes any greenhouse gases. So the important thing to do to reduce your greenhouse gases is to move off of natural gas and onto electricity. But no one wants to do that because the cost is four times more expensive, right? So to get around that, typically what you do is you put a heat pump in for every kilowatt of electricity that goes in to the heat pump, you'll get with an air source two and a half kilowatts of heat coming out of it. So that's still not four to one ratio. You put solar panels on to drive the offset the heat pump, now we're in the same range. So to do those two things, that's the key to moving on to electricity with zero greenhouse gases, right? It's expensive and it's not necessarily right for churches. Take for instance, this space. This space may be unoccupied, um, say 80% of the time, only occupied on the weekends, right? The sanctuary then, okay? So in the sanctuary, it's unoccupied 80% of the time. You won't install a lot of equipment in the sanctuary. If the sanctuary was heated by, a lot of churches are like this, hydronic heating comes from a boiler and those boilers are old and need to be replaced. The sanctuary should be heated with electric baseboard a lot cheaper. You don't heat it often enough that it's going to be expensive. You would keep kind of a low limit, the background, keep it up to five, 10 degrees Celsius. You would do that with heat pumps. So, okay. Now, this is for houses. We've analyzed the cost of fuels and the savings for conservation measures. Next. Propane and fuel oil are not only the dirtiest, they're the most expensive. Next, electricity, like I said, comes in that air source heat pumps, because of that two and a half to one ratio, lower those. Okay. Natural gas, we'll back. Natural gas comes in at five cents a kilowatt hour. That's why everybody heats with natural gas. Okay. Solar power comes in at eight cents a kilowatt hour. So solar power is much cheaper than electricity in the first place. So that's why we put solar power up. It does move our costs less, but it still won't beat the cost of natural gas. Okay, here's where you beat the cost of natural gas and zero greenhouse gases. You put in heat pumps and the, and the combination of uh, of uh, heat, heat pumps and, and net metered solar. That, that's, that's the key. That's expensive, but that's, a, that's the key. In your house, it will pay for it. Next. Some playing with the margins, okay? There's energy conservation measures that will beat the cost of solar panels and heat pumps. We're in the range of 10 to 20 percent of your overall energy. Uh, this is what you've been doing. The light energy retrofits come in this range, but they don't have a large impact, right? The real large impact is in the deep energy retrofit. That's the solar panels and, and the heat pumps. Next. Uh,
Okay, next. These two things, triple glazing and insulating above code levels. So these are measures that Passive House typically uh, enforces. They are good comfort measures. They are not good economical measures. You're better off having a slightly larger heat pump and a few more solar panels on. Okay. That's where natural gas is going with carbon, carbon taxes, right? So we are going to, you know, the, the solar panels and the heat pumps are not affected by carbon taxes. So this is what's going to drive our conversion off of uh, polluting fossil fuels. So here, here's an example of a house that we, we did in Ottawa, and this is typical of most houses. Okay. First thing to do is to move the existing electric loads onto solar. We add insulation to poorly insulated spaces, and I, I mean poorly, right? I mean no insulation in the basement or R30 in the attic. R30 is what you did in the 80s. Um, we top that up to R60, insulate the basement. Sealed drafty houses. I'm talking farmhouse level of drafty house. Space heating, we'd move the space heating, as I said, to heat pumps and net metered solar. And the domestic hot water, we'd move it to heat pumps, net metered solar, or in some cases, if it's uh, electric water heater, um, we'd add in a drain, uh, drain water heat recovery, uh, copper tube wrapped around the sewage stack and net metered solar next. So over time, when we do each of these measures and you do each of those measures at the end of the life of the appliance, typically we move the utility cost down to just $300 a year. The, the, the connection cost to be on hydro, right? You're gonna net, net meter your hydro, which, which means in January, you won't have enough sun to offset your electrical load. So your meter is going to increase. But in uh, June, when there's lots of sun, your meter will decrease. By the entire year, we want to net out to zero. That, that would be the goal. That's what net metering means. And so you must stay connected to the grid and that's, you know, 25 bucks in a, a month for your grid connection uh, times uh, 12 months, you get to 300 bucks a, a year for that. Okay. Right. Oh, back, back one. So, uh, you know, watch um, the decrease in cost by the fuel type. Remember, Changing electricity doesn't really matter in terms of greenhouse gases. It does matter with natural gas. Flow. Yeah. And here you'll see that. So the base case, um, you know, this house creates about 6,000 kilograms of greenhouse gas a year. To, to put the solar on makes a small bit, 400 kilograms. Air sealing, hardly anything, 100 kilograms. Insulating blinds, another hundred. Here, this is where it's significant. We're moving off a of natural gas at this point. We're switching from domestic hot water to heat pump and solar. We dropped, uh, you know, just a, a little bit under 2,000 kilograms at that. And then finally switching the space heating over off of natural gas. Remember, space heating, 65% of the overall energy. Moving that to uh, elect, to basically electric, right, and then offsetting that uh, electricity, thirty seven hundred kilograms. It's the most important, right? That this is a heat pump. Um, this is the same as your central air conditioner, right? We should be outlawing these machines. Central air conditioner. The difference 
between a heat pump and a central air conditioner is a reversing valve, two check valves in the controls, just to change the, the way that the refrigerant moves through the machine, right? You get a heat pump by that incremental change. A heat pump will cost you somewhere, sorry, an air conditioner will cost you somewhere between $5,000 and $7,000. For an additional $2,000, you have a heat pump and you reduce your greenhouse gases by 60%. Just by doing that, $2,000 a year is the best thing that you can do environmentally. And then on top of that, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the $2,000 is a small in investment. Right. Yes. Yes, yes. Geothermal has that ratio of three and a half to one. It is better in terms of reducing your greenhouse gases, uh, but it's much more expensive, right? So. For the, and you know, there's a much more detailed reason we need to go to ground source heat pumps. Um, air source heat pumps revert back to a coefficient of performance of one uh, in, in the extreme cold. Ground source heat pumps always have that three to one, right? So if we all change the air source heat pumps, we would need three times more infrastructure for the coldest day in January, three times more wires, three times more generation. So we need to move towards ground source heat pumps, but we need policies um, to, to, to enforce that. Okay. There are grants right now for homeowners. You can go through all of those. Um, they uh, lie anywhere from five thousand dollars to uh, to a thousand dollars for the domestic hot water. In order to qualify for those grants, you need to get an energy audit done. It's uh, you get a six hundred dollar energy grant, energy audit grant, you need to do one measure. And with that $600, uh, that's about the same cost that the energy auditor would uh, or would charge you. So it's nearly free. It's really important to have a plan what, what you're going to do in order to reduce your greenhouse gases. So. Overall, Canadians contribute about 18 tons of greenhouse gas each individually. If you drive a car on average, you put in 10,000 kilometers a year, you're emitting uh, five tons of greenhouse gas. Your house, you heat with natural gas and it's a 2,000 square foot house, you, you do five tons of greenhouse gas. A lot of the rest is coming from the tar sands in Alberta. We are creating that as Canadians and ex exporting that. Some of, you know, in that five tons in both the transport, your car and your house, I didn't include all the energy and all the greenhouse gases that are lost from the fields in Calgary, pumping it all across the country. So that takes up a, a good portion of the remaining between the 10 tons and the 18 tons. So it's it's important. Next. It's a fact. <laughs> it is a great deal for the NRCAN grants. These are uh, something that you, you should take advantage of. So there are other NR CAN grants, um, solar panels up to $5,000. And then these others are the light energy retrofits that I'm talking about. The windows and doors, the insulation, the air ceiling, and resiliency measures. Next. So when do you do these things? Um, you do it at three quarters of the expected useful life. So 
it, the reasoning goes like this. You, you have a furnace. Your furnace um, uh, will last uh, 20 years. If you wait until 20, that's when it's going to break down in January. You're going to scramble. You're going to ask your HVAC contractor to bring in whatever he has and he's going to bring in the natural gas furnace that's in the in the warehouse that he has available to him. So plan to do it a little bit earlier and uh, you know at, at instead of 20 years do it at 15 and the same for the um, domestic hot water and for the air conditioning unit. Next. Low interest is uh, financing is available. The Better Homes Loan Program by the City of Ottawa for city residents will uh, offer an interest-free loan up to 10% of the value of the property. So if you have a $500,000 property, you can borrow interest-free 50,000. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right, $50,000. Right. So. Uh, that will be available by the end of the month. Um, I believe the date is October 24th, but it could be the 28th. Uh, CMHC has been um, suggesting that they, I, I heard rumors that they're going to offer a $40,000 low interest uh, uh, loan. Um, that hasn't been announced at, at this point. That's in summary, so next. Change your car to an EV, next. Next. Over time, move your house to net zero. So we're gonna knock off 40% on the transportation side, 40% on the building side, that leaves 20% left over and then 20% left over. That's industry's job to, to do that. Next. Tell your friends. And next, advocate for legislation within your community to assist you and your neighbors. And next, tell two friends, they tell two friends, and done. Um, I have to go. Um, I am the uh, regional lead for the climate reality leaders, and um, it's a worldwide organization. I, I have the uh, Ottawa region, and um, I will um, uh, uh, have to go at this point. I, I do have worked on um, churches and building condition assessments and um, the uh, energy audits for churches. They're really challenging because what you need to do is you need to kind of invest in in um, in the structure when you have. Uh, lower and lower financial uh, input in, into the church. So it, it's quite challenging. But, you know, some ideas like replacing, you know, the boiler with electric heat and, um, for, you know, for, you know, the Sunday morning service this Sunday and then, uh, you know, running heat pumps during um, the rest of the week. Uh, at a lower temperature, that might be worthwhile as opposed to trying to re replace, you know, the old steam boilers or, uh, you, you know, those those types of heating systems. So it may be worthwhile. Thank you very much for your time. I do appreciate it. Well, just before we begin, just wanted to say again, thank you, GSS, for having us here. We're always thrilled to talk with other organizations about sustainability and how we fit into the, the sustainability puzzle and getting to see it kind of from, from our perspective on a bit of a contractor's side. So just to start off, I just want to talk, tell you a little bit about us. If you can go to the next slide. So Light & Co. is an energy services company. Um, we've been helping Canadians from coast to coast, although we are based in Ottawa, and we've been around for over 10 years now. Now, primarily, we've been doing LED lighting upgrades and retrofits for businesses and multi-residential places, but we've recently been expanding our services and getting into more environmentally friendly measures that other businesses and places can implement in order to save on energy. So some of the other services that we offer are electrical installation, such as the air source and ground source heat pumps that Dan was just talking about, 
And we're also getting into helping with EV charging, setting up different EV charging stations for tenants or for businesses and large multi-residential communities. Uh, some of the other services that we also offer are the home energy audits that Dan was talking about and doing evaluations for homeowners to see what the best measures will be for them and what makes the most economically um, economic sense for them and getting into renewable installations such as solar panels, solar domestic hot water heaters, and just finding different ways that you can reduce energy consumption and whatever makes sense for your particular case. So if we go to the next slide. So one, I think one of the daunting tasks for some organizations is trying to figure out what is the best first step. We've just heard about a lot of different options that organizations can take. And a lot of the organizations we've heard have done such really good work but sometimes getting started is the most difficult part. And replacing incandescent and fluorescent bulbs is a very easy first step. And replacing those with energy efficient LED lighting is a great way to help reduce your electricity consumption without necessarily breaking the budget. Um, so one of the things about LED lights is that they are produce 80% less power than incandescent bulbs. And for any fluorescent tube or bulb that's out there, there's always an LED equivalent that's either producing two to three times less the amount of power. So regardless of what you have in your facility and your organization at the time, there's probably new technology that's come out and probably new ways to reduce it. Again, giving that low hanging fruit option of not having to break the bank to do this. And some of the other benefits for LEDs are the fact that they have a much longer lifespan. They're usually rated for about 50,000 hours. So that's less replacements for your bulbs and that's less maintenance costs. And for some LED installations, if let's say you're removing some of the old fluorescent ballasts, it means that's gonna eliminate future electrician service calls to go in and replace these failing ballasts. And a lot of times with some of these older buildings that might still have a lot of the incandescent fluorescent lighting, it can present a lot of really good opportunities. Mm -hmm. Some of the other benefits about LED lighting um, is that they produce less heat and they also don't contain any mercury. So recycling and disposal of these bulbs is actually a lot more environmentally friendly. And another misconception you could say about LED lighting is that they always come in just the one color. Usually you'll see it in office settings that daylight color temperature, but you can actually get LEDs that are color adjustable and power adjustable depending on your settings. So depending on whether you have an office space or you have a church and you want softer, warmer light, you can get LEDs that have that softer light while still making sure that you're reducing your, your energy consumption and making your electricity bill a little bit easier. So we always tell people that going in and just taking a look at what's there, because sometimes you're surprised at how many lights get overlooked, areas that just haven't been looked at in a long time, especially in some of these older buildings. Um, and of course, improve light levels and better lumen output whenever you're putting in LED lights. Uh, next slide. The difference is night and day. So this is a, a parking garage that we recently went and did an LED upgrade for. And so not only did this parking garage have bulbs that were 150 watts, they were producing so much heat that they were actually melting holes in the plastic covers that they were housed in. And you can see from the light levels that it's really, really dark in there. So not only is it, you know, affects overall comfort for tenants, it's also a bit of a safety concern as well. So we were able to go in, replace these with new fixtures and new fixtures that only use 40 watts of power and considerably improve the light levels. We also do LED installations for some exterior lighting as well. This same building during COVID, um, a couple of desperate people were trying to break into some of the, uh, the units on the lower level. So having some exterior lighting that's a bit brighter uh, with a very high color temperature and then has higher light output can also improve safety. And depending on the setting, just overall comfort for everybody there. Uh, next slide. One of the other things that I think has been brought up quite a few times is all the different programs that are currently available. And I think another tough first step is figuring out what program is right for you and figuring out what program is going to be the most beneficial. And one of the programs that we utilize for lighting here in Ontario is the Save on Energy program from the IESO. And so the Save on Energy program provides a financial monetary incentive for each LED lighting measure that you're installing. So whether that's if you're just putting a couple of LED tubes, you could get $3 a tube. Or for some new fixtures or pot lights, you can get a much higher incentive as well. They can also include things like putting occupancy sensors into, let's say, you know, 
if let's say you're an apartment building and you're putting them into the garbage rooms that aren't used very often, or just any room that really isn't utilized very often to ensure that lights aren't being left on and you're not just you know, wasting more money and energy than you have to. Uh, the Save on Energy program, it's available to everybody in Ontario. Uh, we like to help our applicants kind of walk through the process step-by-step step, um, through the, the pre-project and post-project stage, reaching out for other information, but it's a great program that you can take advantage of. They also have other measures for HVAC and some, for motors, but I feel like lighting is probably what the Save on Energy program is utilized the most for. So it's something that you know anyone in Ontario can do if they're just looking to get a little bit of extra incentive back and if they're renovating and doing a retrofit for, for their organization. Um, next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the City of Ottawa programs that have come out recently. Um, I know that Dan's touched on it uh, as well, but I'll go through some of them. Um, so he was mentioning that right now, uh, the Better Homes Loan Program through NRCAN is gonna be coming out and with loans up to you know, $5,000 or 10% of your, um, your house value. And these are great programs to utilize. Um, so for anything like the air source and ground source heat pumps, uh, getting into like solar installations, those are all great examples. And just as Dan mentioned, using those in conjunction with each other is a great way to really maximize the energy savings you're looking to get. But you can also do just lower cost measures as well, whether it's just doing some insulation on the outside of your windows, some energy star windows and appliances, um, getting better insulation so that your HVAC equipment isn't having to work as hard in the summer and the, and the winter and will eventually last longer because it's not having to strain itself so much. So those are really good programs for, for homeowners. And they also have the similar loans through the City of Ottawa's Energy Evolution, uh, their Better Buildings Ottawa program, as well as the Home Energy Efficiency Rebate, which just like I mentioned with the Better Loans program, will offer up to like a $5,000 incentive for any of these energy saving measures that you're looking to implement. So you can mix and match between the two, just anything that's really helping to reduce your environmental footprint. As we know, the city of Ottawa's energy evolution strategy is to have, you know, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by to Ottawa wide by 2050, but they also have other energy saving reduction goals that, and conservation goals that they're looking to get. So uh, anything, something like the energy performance program for the ISO might not be suitable for one uh, individual faith organization, but because they have a certain kilowatt hours threshold that they have to reach. But there are other programs that are out there just to make any retrofits you're looking uh, to make a little bit more economically viable. Um, next slide. And I think in terms of next steps, um, trying to find what's the best way to go about making your organization more sustainable is exactly what everyone here is doing. Just reaching out, gaining a little bit more knowledge, meeting with other environmental organizations and people who are trying to make environmental changes and energy reduction changes, and even just reaching out to some local environmentally conscious businesses and getting a consultation or an audit just to see what the base case is. So what Light & Co, what we do is we'll provide a no cost audit and proposal where we'll go through your facility, we'll examine all of the lighting as well as some other factors that might have energy saving opportunities. But generally with our you know, no audit lighting proposal, we'll go through and examine everything and try and build a base case because we wanna understand what's going on with the building and where the biggest areas of opportunity are. And so that you also understand what spaces could be really improved on and how we can actually go about getting the maximum uh, percentage of energy reduced. So we're always trying to answer the questions, where are the biggest areas and spaces for opportunity? What measures make sense in that space, but still maximize the amount of energy we can reduce and can gain the largest government incentive? Does it make more sense to go with a, a smaller option, like just replacing yeah, fluorescent bulbs with something that's LED compatible or removing some of the fluorescent ballast and putting in some potentially more uh, challenging energy saving measures. And is it economically viable at this time or is it something that has to be maybe spaced out over several different projects? So I think that just the more you understand about your facility and your organization, the better it, and the easier it is to figure out what programs are right for you and what energy saving measures best fit uh, with your organization. I always like to think of it as like a puzzle, but you're just not looking at the pieces in the right way just yet. And so having a better understanding of what's there now 
gives you a better understanding of where you should go and where you should proceed with your, your next steps. Uh, so uh, next slide. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, if you ever have any questions, uh, just in general, whether it's about LED lighting, solar, heat pumps, or some of these programs, feel free to give us a call or send an email to info at lightandco.com. And we'd be more than happy just to reach out, provide some advice and provide some help as to what the best next steps would be for, for your organization. Or if you just want some additional information, whether it's about LEDs or, or anything that's out there. And otherwise, I hope to be able to answer any other questions you guys have. Thank you.